Good evening, Saints Church. Thank you for coming out on a warm Wednesday and joining us for prayer. I love prayer. Prayer is just digging right deep into the presence of God, big time. And we get to do that corporately. We get to do it with family. And the great thing by doing this in this big house is we get to do this not having to feel like we're alone in what we're going through. And I don't know if you ever think that, that in the moment of prayer and you have something that you bring in the presence of God, that you actually may think that there's somebody sitting a few seats over that is dealing with something just about the same. And we can just be vulnerable, open-hearted, and come before God. So, ah, so good to be here. I want to shout out our online crew that is watching. We have some dedicated hosts that are hanging out with our our. Uh, our uh, YouTube and live stream crew and Facebook and um, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in and for being with us in prayer on this beautiful Wednesday. Uh, I want to introduce you guys to um, a house rule that we had back in uh, my family when I was growing up. My, my dad had established this house rule and this house rule was rule number one. Dad is always right. <laughs> Rule number two. Now you guys are wondering, how, where does this go, right? Rule number two. If dad, for some reasons, is not right, rule number one automatically goes into effect. I'll let, I'll let this process. Okay. But it was a very basic, fun, silly house rule that my dad had established that no matter what, he was right. And uh, there is some truth to house, house rules sometimes, and I want to take you into a house rule or three house rules that the Apostle Paul had established for the Thessalonian church. And I want to give you quick context. The Thessalonian church was a church plant, a new fresh church, and it was a building process. And Paul multiple times tried to go and visit, and he couldn't, and he ends up sending these letters. And in the end of one of those letters, he's giving them these three house rules. And we find those in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. We're going to pull them up in a second on that screen. Um, and and this, this section said, in verse 16, it says, always be joyful. And then in verse 17, it says, never stop praying. And then in verse 18, it says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And actually correlates with your way is better. His way is better, right? His will is better than our will. I'm going to read the scripture again, and if you do have pen and pencil and you do have a physical Bible in front of you, I'd like for you to circle a few things. Verse 16, always be joyful. Circle that word always. And verse 17, it says, never stop praying. I want you to circle the two words, never stop. And then in verse 18, where it says, be thankful in all circumstances, I want you to circle the word all circumstances. If there was a title to this message, I would give it the title, no matter what. No matter what. Let me pray. God, I want to say thank you so much for this night. Thank you so much for brothers and sisters, for us being able to gather to freely worship and praise you, come before you, stepping into, our, uh, into your presence and embracing you, feeling you, knowing that you are here. God, I'm asking you for this time that you're going to be in this scripture, that you're going to be in this sharing. And God, ultimately, I want to set myself back. God, this is not about me. This is not about what I have to say, but plainly about you, Jesus, what you want to do in our hearts tonight. And we thank you in your mighty name we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. Hey, for, for while I speak, I, I gladly want to engage you guys in, in, in the speaking. So no matter what, it's going to be a phrase that I'm going to repeat a little bit here and there. You guys just jump in and you say it with me, all right? So I want to give you guys three thoughts on those three house rules that the Apostle Paul gave the Thessalonian church, which 
They were in the building process and going back to Nehemiah 2.18, what has been a little bit our anchor verse in the last few weeks when it comes to rising and rebuilding Saints Church. We can apply this because we're in a building process, and I think these are three simple households that are universally uh, applicable. Um, the very first thought or house rule that I would love to give you guys is always praise. In that, fir- in, in that first verse of, uh, uh, of that section that I was giving you, it says, always be joyful. And, and the word praise actually can be translated into a expression of joy. So it correlates. Praising and always being joyful, uh, joyful correlates. It's the same thing. So always praise. We, we, we don't praise so that we can get a praise report. We always praise because we always praise. There is no condition. There is no restriction. The, there's no anticipation. We praise because we praise. It's a house rule. It doesn't matter what's going on. We praise. We're, jay- we're joyful. Sometimes we have these challenges that we face in life. But guess what? We always praise no matter we always praise no matter I, I want to share a little story where, where I actually struggled with this particular section of praising no matter what. And that is actually going back about 10 years. Our youngest daughter had been born, and uh, she was, I guess, just entering the toddler age, about a year old. Uh, she had discovered the, 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 the gift of walking and uh, having parents on her toes, and we had to periodically go and visit the pediatrician for blood tests, checking the child's development, and one of the blood tests that had come back, uh, we received a phone call, and that phone call was not an ordinary phone call, uh, just because of the time and place that this phone call took place. It was the head pediatrician that called, and it wasn't on a weekday. It actually happened to be on a Sunday morning. And we were in church. We were busy in church, three services. I believe it was just the first service that had started. And my wife checks her phone, and she sees a voicemail. And you know how sometimes there's transcription, but she listens to the voicemail and hears that is the main doctor from the pediatrician clinic that is making this phone call, and his words are something like this. Uh, Ms. Mashkiewicz, we need you to come in because we detected an, an abnormal high amount of white blood cells in Hannah's blood, and we need you to come in for some tests. Now, when you get this phone call on a Sunday morning from the main doctor who doesn't see any patients but is making the difficult phone calls, your heart just starts sink, sinking. And even worse is, we have no idea what that means. And what do you do when you don't know what anything means? You go and Google it. (laughs) And that's the worst thing we could have done. Because when you Google high amount of blood cells, uh, white blood cells, the first thing that pops up is cancer in the blood. And now imagine this is on a Sunday morning. We can't call back. We can't deal with it. Now we're left and stranded for this entire Sunday trying to figure out when to get the earliest phone call because we feel like this is a 911 because the doctor called us on a Sunday morning. And what we actually did is we stepped out of church. Um, I was a wreck. My wife was a wreck. We stood across the corner from the church, and we're trying to figure out and navigate, what are we going to do? And a friend of ours, he just happened to walk by, observing that we were going through something. And Liz and I, we're, we're, we're navigating, and we received this encouragement to keep praising God. Even though everything that Google just taught us means our child has leukemia. And we have to deal with this. And yet we were encouraged to keep praising God. And we were wrestling. It was like, all right, are we going to call it off? We're going to tell the pastors that we're not going to be here for the rest of the Sunday because we need to sort our emotions out and our feelings and go home and cry some more. Or are we going to make a step 
counter our emotions, step back into the house of God, and enter into praise. And that's exactly what we did that day. That's exactly what we did that day. We always praise, no matter Sometimes our circumstances are not very promising, but we praise no matter what. The second house rule, house rule that, that Paul gave to the Thessalonian church is never stop praying. So therefore, the second house rule is we always pray no matter We always pray no matter what. And I love this about this church because this church is so centered around prayer. We don't stop praying. There is a chasing after God's prayer, uh, God's presence in prayer because we want to engage with him in his presence. And, and, and when I think about praying, I, 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 I gravitate to uh, a mentor of mine. And, and uh, one of my mentors is George Mueller. And you're probably wondering, like, is it that George Mueller that lived uh, somewhere around the 1820s? Like, yeah, that George Mueller. Yeah, that actually was one of my mentors, or st technically still is. But I have mentors in my life that I've never met. They've written great books, and they've lived a life from start to finish, exemplifying a relationship with God in a way how we should follow it. And so George Mueller is known for being a man of prayer. He's one of those guys who prayed, and when he prayed, he, he, he did a lot of ministry with orphans and kids. I'll give you some numbers in a second. But he was the guy who sat around the dining table wanting to feed orphans, and there was no food. He had no food. But he would gather the kids around the table and said, hey, we're going to thank God for the food we're about to have. And then he would close his eyes, he would pray, and as he would pray, he would hear a knock on the door, and the baker from down the street said, hey, because I just somehow felt like I needed to drop this off at your house. And they had food to eat. This is to put into, into, in, into uh, perspective how much of, a, uh, of an influence, uh, influential man George Mueller was. He, uh, his ministry educated 120,000 children. And that's, that's 1820s, 1825 beginning of the 19th century. So not all these, you know, multi-social media, uh, internet tools that just cast this broad net and we can say, all right, a million people saw what we did. No, this was old school. He uh, educated 120,000 kids. He cared for 10,000 orphans in his lifetime. And one of his principles was, I don't ask people for anything, I ask God. He was a man of prayer. He pastored a church of 1,200 people. At that time, I don't even know where we were in the Industrial Revolution at that time, so I'm trying to figure out if there was electricity or not. But gathering 1,200 people in a church building and pastoring that many people, he had this um, routine, this morning routine, that he would spend a lot of time in prayer. As soon as he woke up, he would pray all the way under breakfast, often lasting for hours. And he said this about his discipline of prayer. He said, the first 15 to 30 minutes were rough. So difficult to engage in prayer, constantly finding himself being sidetracked, being distracted, and wanting to leave the place of prayer. And then after that time frame of 15 to 30 minutes, he then would discover the full fullness of God in the presence, on his knees, in prayer. And, and here's a fun fact. This man had a habit of documenting his prayer. He went into detail. He journaled his prayer. And what he did is he had a journal, and when you open up a book, you have two, faces, two pages that face each other. On one side, he would journal the prayer request. On the other side, he would journal how that prayer was answered and when it was answered. This man recorded 50,000 prayers answered in his lifetime. Journaled on paper. 
I want to illustrate that to you guys just so that you see. You guys all know what this is, right? It's the wonderful uh, composition book that we all have to buy in September because our kids are going back to school. And then all they do is uh, write pictures and comic stuff in there. And anyway, these books, standard, come with 100 uh, 100 pages. Picture 500 of these books equaling 50,000 prayer requests. If I stacked them up on the floor, I actually did the calculation because I I measured the thickness. It would stack up from the floor all the way to the ceiling. This man was so dedicated in prayer, he knew the motto, always pray, no matter. But interestingly, those 50,000 prayers were only the answered prayers. It is to believed that only half of his prayers were ever answered. I know we sometimes focus on the answered prayers, but I need you to know, we don't pray to get. We pray because of who he is. We always pray, no matter The third house rule. Thank you. The third house rule, verse uh, 18, it says, Be thankful in all circumstances. You know, circumstances uh, sometimes have a very big impact on our prayer life. Sometimes we don't pray until we encounter a circumstance that makes us pray because we realize there is no other way out. So when circumstances are not going a good way, then we start the pity process. Oh, at least for me. I'm going to be honest here, right? This is typically how, how it happens. I'm happy where I am. My prayer life decreases. And then uh, I find myself in a circumstance where I'm like, ooh, I just realized I really do need God. Because whatever I'm encountering right now is too big for me. And so then my circumstance leads me to going into the presence of God. But that, that's not, no, 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 it's in, in all circumstances, right? We, 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 we just said that we, we always praise no matter, exactly, we always pray no matter. And, and then in, in this third house rule, we're, we're always thankful no matter. I want to go back to, to George Mueller. Um, because he helped me in a situation in my life where things were really dark and really dim. Um, I don't know if, if, if you've ever gotten the phone call. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking a mystery here, but uh, in, in, my, in my ministry life, uh, one of my mentors said, Simon, be prepared. One day you're going to get a phone call. Your mom, your dad, somebody in your family, it's bound to happen. We, we, we can't skip death. Just be prepared. One day you're going to get that phone call. And uh, less than four years ago, actually, it's going to be September, it's going to be four years, I got that phone call. Uh, I was sitting in a staff meeting, and I think it was during the praise and worship time, and my brother calls me. And I don't answer phone calls during praise and worship. And so I hang up on him, and then my dad calls me. And I hang up on him, too. And then I get a text message, which I then saw when I was sitting down. And the text message said, Simon, mom just passed away. Now, you guys know my family uh, is from Germany. This is where my mom lived, or or, or my dad still does. And so there was a, a distance. And for me, this was a total surprise. This was not something that I saw coming. This was not something I could plan around where I say, let me go book a flight so I can see her one more time. This was out of the blue. It was that phone call, and it was that shock. And uh, yeah, that, that day was a big blur for me because of all the emotions that I encountered. My mom and I, we were really close. Uh, despite the distance, she, she learned how to navigate the internet. She figured out how to work Facebook because that's where we would post a lot of pictures on our life and life updates and then Instagram and that would be posted on Facebook. And she would call and she would send us packages and she would bake and she would send those cookies all the way from Germany to the USA. 
so that we could have our home-baked special goods. And that was a real hard hit for me. But I'm going to loop this back around to George Mueller, and I'm going to loop this back around to house rule number three, always be thankful no matter. Because George Mueller, the man of prayer who has seen 50,000 of his prayers answered, journaled, written, documented, not a wild guess, he encountered a similar situation. His wife passed away. And when his wife passed away, he actually preached at his wife's funeral. And he preached on a psalm, which is uh, Psalm 119.68. And it says, you are good and do only good. And he preached a three-topic sermon, which really helped me to go through what I was going through. And these three points that he had, he, he preached on his wife and he said, the Lord was good and did good in giving my wife to me. Then the second point was the Lord was good and did good for leaving her with me. And then the third point was the Lord was good and did good in taking her from me. I was like, all right. Let me lean on a man who probably, certainly has encountered the presence of God in a much deeper, more profound way than I ever have. And he is able to stand up and preach a sermon in one of the darkest moments in his life. I've walked with my dad through the loss of my mom. For me, it was a little bit easier than for him. Yes, it was my mom who I loved. And by the way, some things were unearthed after she passed away, going through her journals and how many scriptures she had written down. Insane of a woman of God she was. But my dad, going through the process, almost telling me, like, I understand now why people who have been married for a long time and lose their partner want to take their life. But we came back to this illustration of George Mueller who said, I'm thankful and you, God, did good and did good in taking her from me. He surrendered his will to God's will saying, I always will be thankful, no matter. The three house rules again. Always praise, no matter. Always pray, no matter. Always be thankful, no matter. I, I want to go back. Yeah, you, you can come out, Chris. Um, I want to go back to that house rule that was a silly house rule in our house. And it made me smile as a little child, but I felt like there is a spiritual truth to it. Rule number one, God is on the throne. God sits on the throne. That's rule number one. Rule number two, even when God does not, hang on, let me rephrase, rephrase theologically. Even when it seems like God does not sit on the throne, Rule number one automatically goes into effect, which is God sits on the throne. Mia, thank you for helping me. God is good. Rule number two, even when it does not feel like God is good, rule number one automatically goes into... If we apply these rules to our life, we are going to be in a much different place. Because ultimately, and this is what the scripture says right here, for this is God's will for our life. Because his way is. You know, back to rule number one, even when it feels like God is not working. <laughs> rule number one automatically goes into effect. Because God is always working. Can I have you guys stand to your feet? And, and can we engage in a, in a moment of, of prayer? 
in a moment of engaging and, and maybe anchoring these house rules deep inside of our heart. Just, just to remember, I'm not feeling like praising right now because this is what happened at work. Or I don't feel like praising right now because I'm dealing with this issue in my family. Or you're encountering a challenge in your health. We always praise. We always pray. And maybe you've been praying and you never stopped praying until you stopped praying. And then in the process of you stopping to pray, you started to get upset at God because he didn't answer your prayer. But we don't stop no matter what. Pastor Dorso didn't know what I was going to speak on. And he opened up with a scripture that says we're going into his presence and step before the altar in thanksgiving. We're always going to be thankful. We're always going to be thankful.